All right. Good morning, guys. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why certain books are written? I'm not talking about Christian books. Any kind of book, any kind of fiction book, for example, or comic or magazine. Have you ever wondered what the purpose was for them being written? What are some possible intentions aside from profit? Let's forget about the income and the profit. What else? What other purposes can you think of? Entertainment, yes, for fiction, for comics, right? What else? What? what? Information and inspiration, yes. So information for some academic books, right? Inspiration for the like the the maybe the dev- devotionals, maybe, and some of those. What else? What other? What other purposes? They so expression. They want to express their experiences. This happened to me, and 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 all of that, right? What other stuff? Maybe instruction. Yes, before YouTube University came about, right? It was books. Like, how do you you want to learn something? Buy this book. Buy that book. What else? To spread a message, an agenda, a propaganda. Yes, exactly. Right? So many times it's books because once it's published and printed, especially now it can be photocopied, PDF, right? And you blast it all over the internet and suddenly people read. So there's so many reasons for why a book can be written. And today, we're actually uh, closing our gospel Synoptic Gospel Series sermon. I know that people were excited for it, but Guys, we're still one-fourth of the way, (laughs) okay? If you look at all the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're one-fourth of the way. We're not even halfway. And uh, uh, what we're doing is we're going to summarize and just talk about today what is really the purpose for why the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written, okay? Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to jump from one text to another, and I'll tell you which ones. One reason why the Gospels were written, obviously, was the rapid spread of the church. When the apostles, the, the disciples, the 12 minus 1, 11, and then became 12 again, right? When the apostles uh, spread the Gospel, the church grew very, very rapidly. And because of that, they had to write something to clarify. Because you know how uh, news spreads when it's word of mouth, right? Many times things change along the way. So they had to write something down. So there's an actual source. So the news won't like get twisted. So that's one. Another reason was the apostles were dying one by one. You know, eventually they would, you know, one person would get killed, another person would get killed, and then get killed, right? So they were getting picked off one by one. So they had to make sure that there is something written so that it can be passed down. But one giant reason is a combo reason. And that combo reason is the integrity of the good news and so that the good news will be heard. So it was missional. It wasn't for profit. It wasn't for entertainment. It wasn't for inspiration, although it was for instruction. It's to instruct people. So go to Luke 1, the one we've read, verse 1 to 4. Uh, He says, so why did Luke write Luke. So why did the Apostle Luke write the Gospel of Luke? And he says so right here very clearly. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. And then he gives the reason. So that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So imagine this. Luke did not write for everybody. He wrote for one dude. Imagine this. Luke followed everything, did everything, and they did not have a keyboard yet where you can just delete, delete, backspace, copy, paste. They didn't have that, okay? They didn't have the technology to get an email from John or from Peter and then just copy pastes it and then edits it. He had to get a scroll, open it up, put a pebble or a stone there, put another stone here so the scroll will not refold, right? He would have to put that everywhere and he would have to stand, look, stand, look, and you know, it was tiring for one guy, Theophilus. Why? So that Theophilus may have certainty concerning the things that Theophilus was taught. 
This is an extremely powerful picture of love and discipleship. Theophilus was probably a new believer and needed assurance that his belief in Christ was worth the cost. So when people were, were getting killed, were getting you know um, uh, martyred, and here's Theophilus, and he was probably semi-rich, this, this guy. Imagine how much he had to lose. Like if, if there's someone who's down on his luck with nothing to lose, going to Christ, sure. But for someone with so much to lose, to come to Christ, that's painful. And so what happened? He was probably wondering and he probably, uh, he and Luke were probably good friends. And Luke, what did he do? He didn't just sit down and say, let's have some coffee. You know, it's a big shop, brand new, new opening. It's not like that. He really took the time. He followed everything. He talked to people. Imagine how long it would take to send not an email, uh, not even snail mail, ship mail. He had to send a, ma a letter through a ship to get to the different apostles everywhere to get contacts and to say, okay, give me And then he had to wait for all of these to come back to him. And then he had to compile them. And then he had to look. And then he had to write. And, you know, they didn't have 1,000 watts LED before. So when, it, when night hits, it's under a candlelight. Imagine writing. Like, we're so used to the keyboard. It's easy. How many of you still use the ball pen? You know how, like, um, you use the ball pen so much and then it engraves in your finger? So, imagine the effort. I'm, I'm talking about these things because I want you guys to see how much love Luke must have had for Theophilus to go through all this. They did not have NCM manuals, which you can get and just sit and just read. Imagine you have to write the manual yourself to disciple the guy. How many of us have that much love for someone else? To disciple them. To pick up paper and to start writing. Here's what happened with Jesus. Here's everything. And then you just do a word count on the book of Luke. How many people are willing to write a novella for someone who's wondering, is it worth it to come to Christ? This is how worth it it is. You're worth all the pain I'm taking right now. Here's how worth it it is. That is an extremely good, powerful picture of love. You see, many historians record history for the sake of history. Many other historians want society to learn from the tragedies of history, right? To learn from the past. Others maybe just want to be record keepers or to make money. The more historically accurate, maybe the more people buy their books. And most people really don't care much. But for those who, wrote, who write or wrote the Gospels, the Gospels are not just historical documents, but they are missional documents. The purpose really is for saving and discipling the lost. It's for other people to get saved and then for them to get discipled. It's very interesting that Luke actually uses the words, the things that have been accomplished among us, right? In verse 1, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. These are not generic accomplishments. You know, so in their group, right, there's Peter, there's John, and Peter was a fisherman, right? He could have focused on, this is a Guinness World Book Records when a ship was filled with so much fish, the ship almost sank. Ripley's, believe it or not. Right? Like, he, this was not just any kind of generic accomplishments. But these are specific accomplishments with a very missional purpose. And that purpose points to the cross and the resurrection. I've said this before and I'll say it again. The reason why they wrote this is because of a very specific reason and that reason only. They didn't care so much about anything else. And it was the perfect era because there were no deep fakes, no photoshops, no life insurance, no banks in the Cayman Islands, no tints or shades in vehicle windows. Everyone knew everyone and it was a very small population. So when they wrote with eyewitnesses, you know these are historical facts. They happen. Even the best, bestest atheists, atheist historians would say, 
they cannot question the historicity, historicity and accuracy of the biblical documents. They will disagree with the religious underpinnings, but they cannot disagree with the facts and historicity of the biblical documents. So what we have is a faith based and rooted on logic, facts, history that cannot be contested. Right? And that is the confidence we have. And that is why they were written, so that we actually have this confidence. Imagine if our religion today, Christianity, did not have these facts. There's a specific reason why nobody takes Zeus uh, seriously. Like how many people do you know worship Zeus? No one, right? In fact, if you really, really think about it, the only religions that are really taken seriously right now are, are, is Judaism and Christianity. And then, of course, there's Islam because it's based on Judaism and Christianity. Those are the top three. Everything else will not matter. It's here and there, left and right. There are more idealisms than actual religions. So we have this basis of our faith. They were all passed down by ministers of the word as well. And that's exactly how Luke says it in verse 2. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So their goal was what? To minister. Every single preaching that we do in NCC, our prayer is to minister. Not Yes, there's teaching. Yes, there's instruction. Yes, there's exegesis. But the goal really is to minister. Because if we cannot minister, there's no point. Right? So we have two big questions for ourselves now. The first is this. Are we willing to undertake heavy tasks for the spiritual well-being of others? How willing are we? I'll give you some examples, and I know some might seem difficult, but actually they're not. For example, apologetics. Actually studying apologetics. I'm not talking about uh, requesting the church, hey, let's have an apologetics class, please. I'm talking about you going on YouTube by yourself and just searching Apologetics 101. How many of us do that just for the simple basic idea of what if I'm going to disciple someone and he has questions? I want to be equipped. How many of us invest in buying books, actual theological books or apologetics books just because you have a heart to disciple others? I'm not talking about writing them. I'm talking about reading them. Someone already took the pains to write them. How many of us have that much love for others to have the time to do real study for exegetical accuracy? Like really open the commentaries, you know? First buy the commentaries. You know what? You don't even have to buy. Just go to Bible.org and read and just prepare. How many of us have that love for others? to do that for them? These are challenging and painful questions. How about this? Just a casual reading of basic, basic books on evangelism. Just basic. If not casual reading, how about this na lang? Being willing to just hang out with somebody else over coffee. You don't even have to pay for them. You pay for yourself, and all you have to do is hang out and listen. How many of us are willing to do that? How many of us are willing to say, when you've got struggles, when you've got sin issues, call me up at 3 a.m., I'll wake up for you. I'll pray, we pray, you pray, then you talk, I listen. At 3 in the morning. How many of us are willing to do that? Ang standard ni Luke is so high, no? But for us, what do we do? Normally, here's the problem with us. We, we also take in so much of the world and we say, I have healthy boundaries. So all of my phones, all of my ano, they're all off. No one gets to touch me from this time to this time. And Jesus says, I'll die for you. Greater love has no man than this. To wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning for someone else. Can we? Why does he go to work phone, turn it off? Per personal phone? For brothers and sisters in the Lord? We gonna turn that off too? You know what I'm actually saying? No matter what problem you have at 3 o'clock a.m., 2 a.m., don't call me, huh? You're on your own. The devil can have you isolated for all I care. 
It's painful to hear. How much love do we have for one another? Reaching out for one another. Just, hey, how are you? Hey, I heard you've been sick. Hey, I heard this, I heard that. What's up? You okay na? How about practical stuff, padalag grab? You don't even have to drive. You just grab food, address, send there. I'll say, address nimo. These are simple questions. But this is love for one another. And this is the cost of discipleship. Why were the Gospels written? It's for us to grow in love for God and others. The purpose is evangelism and discipleship, not just evangelism. If it's only for evangelism, they should have just, you know, if it's just for evangelism, it should have just been. Jesus came to die on the cross for sins, repent, believe, period. And then they could have just copied it en masse. But it's not just for evangelism. It's evangelism and discipleship. I guess the second question is connected to the first. Are there people in our lives that we are intentionally laboring for? Laboring for. Going after them. Running after them. Calling them. We pray for them, yes. Faith without works is dead. Prayer without doing anything, especially if you can actually do it, kind of doesn't make sense. right? Are we doing stuff? You see, here's the thing. If you don't need to be intelligent for this, you just have to be faithful. A lot of times we make that excuse and it's, it's, a, it's a cousin of the pa-victim effect. The pa-victim excuse is, I can't do it because I'm a victim. The cousin of that is, I can't do it because I'm not good enough. I'm not equipped enough. Can I just say something that that will just perfectly make sense lang, I hope? It's this. Think of a topic you're very interested in. Not Christian. Any other topic. Think of your favorite video game. Your favorite Marvel movie. Your favorite hobby. I bet you, you did not take time to try to memorize things. If I ask you, what's your favorite part in Endgame? Oh, it was when the time when, you know, cap on your left. You know, like, you don't have to memorize it. It's just there in your head, right? If you're passionate about something, you don't need to study it. It's just by default. So, believe it or not, if you truly are passionate about God and love God and love others and are passionate about discipleship, you don't need to memorize things. You just have to be, you just need to have passion for it. So, if you're trying to memorize things just so that you can do discipleship, I would dare say, examine yourself. I don't mean that you, you have to memorize every single detail or remember every single detail. You know, like the dates. When was Cyprius born? When was Augustine born? Like, you know, I'm not talking about that. But just the basics. You can actually say, you know, there was this dude, his name was Augustine. I don't remember his birth and death. But, but he did say something along the lines of, this isn't word for word. But here's the essence of it. You'll know these things because you're passionate about them. If we're so passionate about our hobbies that we can remember stuff, you know, think about it. Greater love has no man than this. To be passionate about the gospel and wake up at 2 a.m. Kaya? If dili kaya, problem. Agree? And Jesus' standard is what? Damn. Luke's standard is write an entire gospel. Ours is have coffee. I hope that we, we take this to heart. Especially now during a season where we are trying to examine ourselves as a church. Jump to Luke 19. I know we're, we're going to jump past, so we're going to be jumping from one text to another. We're going to be in Luke 19, verse 9 and 10 only. And then I'm going to read Matthew 5, 17 and 18. So Luke 19, verse 9 says, Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house since he, he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So why did the Son of Man come? To seek, to save the lost. That's very, very clear. It's very obvious. Like he says it right there. And Matthew 5 verse 17 and 18 says this. You don't have to jump there. It's two verses. I'll just read it. Go on along to John 18 ahead if you want. John 18. But I'm in Matthew 5. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So, seeking and saving the lost and the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, they go together. Don't divorce them, don't separate them, they go together. Okay? There's another way to say this. How does Christ seek and save the lost? By fulfilling the law and the prophets. How does Christ fulfill the law and the prophets? By seeking and saving the lost. They fulfill each other perfectly. You know how you know those um, puzzles that you you uh, I don't know like these Japanese puzzles are made of metal and then you try the the goal is to remove the ring from inside and then you gotta you know do all these things and the harder it gets I I noticed that you know my cousin gave me this puzzle for Christmas you know she gave me a headache for my for a Christmas gift so I was like ah I can't do it and then I I I cheated I went on YouTube so I found out. You have to do something where you do everything together to get the ring out. So in the same sense, the fulfilling of the law and the prophets and the seeking, seeking and saving the lost, they go together and one cannot be fulfilled without the other being fulfilled at the same time. So it's simultaneous. Now, why is this so important? Because the word of God, the Bible, and the life of Christ are perfectly connected. You cannot get to know God apart from God's Word, the Bible. And you cannot get closer to Christ apart from God's Word. At the same time, if you read God's Word, immediately there is that connection already with Christ. So, here's the thing, and here's our problem. The purpose is to what? Seek and save the lost. We can study the Scripture for theological accuracy. But if that alone is your purpose, just theological accuracy, just to get to know Christ alone, that's it. I just read the Bible to get to know Jesus. It sounds so good, no? Just to know Jesus, just to love Jesus, to love God more. That's it. What about love for the lost? That's not really in my head. Then you've totally missed the point. Totally. Because if you say you want to love Jesus, loving the lost is the immediate, direct, automatic by default effect if you don't read the bible for the lost as well at some point i'm not saying always but at some point it has to point there then you've totally missed it because again jesus came to seek and save the lost so why why would we divorce that ourselves we all study and read and and do all our spiritual disciplines for personal spiritual growth. That's true. But again, it's like studying cancer. If you're trying to study cancer without looking for a cure, what's the point? You're just getting better and better at finding out how cancer kills. What's the point of that? There has to be an end game, a purpose for it that's higher. And that's also why we study scripture. You know, all theological accuracy will be done once we're in heaven face to face, right? Jesus promised what? Through, the, through his word. What did he say? We see through a mirror dimly right now. It's like we've got spiritual, you know, eye gla uh, uh, what's it called? Eyes that are not very 100%. Not 2020 vision, right? Maybe we have uh, spiritual astigmatism or something. But once we get to heaven, we see him face to face perfectly. So, the whole point why we're here is not to see him perfectly because it's never going to happen anyway. The point here, while we're here, is to see him well enough so that we can point people to him. We're on mission, right? It says, well, I, I won't get ahead of myself, but, but that's the whole point of it. That's also why when we, when we have intellectual pride, I'll call it differently, intellectual vanity, I think it's actually worse than ignorance. Because a person who's ignorant is not responsible for a lot of things. Right? With great power comes great responsibility. With great knowledge comes great accountability. So, if we study, 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 but it's not applied, it's pointless. And we're guilty of more. And this is also why when we do begin discipleship with others, what do we say at the very beginning? 
there's always one phrase that I always say in the very beginning of discipleship process with someone. And this will freak them out, but I say it anyway. I say, bro, bro, one day, not tomorrow, but one day, you're going to do this for somebody else. Because that's what my friend did for me. First day of my discipleship, we sit down, we have coffee. He says, bro, one day you're going to do this for someone else. And I'm like, I'm going to mess it up. I don't think I'm going to do that. And he said, no, bro, just trust me, you know, trust in the Lord, et cetera, et cetera, you know, but no pressure, not right now, but eventually. And he was right. And that's what we have to do as well when we do discipleship. We tell them, you're going to do this for somebody else. Maybe not tomorrow, but give it some time and, and trust in the Lord for your growth. That's the whole point of it. Now, I said Matthew, uh, John 18, so we're going to be in John, verse 18. I know we're skipping because we're trying to connect everything together. Verse 33, so John 18, verse 33. This is now the scene with Pilate. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests, uh, chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? So look at the interplay here. They're, they're playing. It's like a game. I'm sorry, not the word playing, but there's like a verbal tug of war. Yeah, they're sparring. They're... They're, they're kind of testing each other. And I love what Jesus says in verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So, so Jesus is saying, I'm a king. Yeah, you, that's right. But just not of this world because there's the now and not yet. Right? So he's not yet. It's a, he's talking about the not yet. So Pilate said to him, so you are a king? So you're, you're confirming. In other words, Pilate is saying, you're rebelling. You're starting a coup d'etat. Right? You're, what, the Jews' accusation of you is that you're trying to start this rebellion and you're going to try to overthrow the empire. So they're correct. You, you're, you're claiming to be king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. But for this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice so we pause there this scene is actually one of the most pivotal and crucial scenes in all of the gospels it's jesus and pilate why because what happened after this see jesus could have said hey 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 i, I i'm not i'm no king i'm not trying to do any kind of a could it hear, you know, I, I'm just being religious. Like he could have said that. But what did he say? He said, I came to bear witness to the truth. So he neither confirmed nor he denied, but he implied that there is a kind of kingdom that he's bringing in. So look at what happened in verse 38. When he says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice, Pilate said to him, what is truth? So it's like he's lost interest. Like I, this isn't, I'm not here for philosophy. I'm here for politics. Okay, like, I just want to figure things out if you should die or not. Apparently, you shouldn't die because you're not trying to do any kind of coup d'etat here. So, Pilate went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? So, he's implying something. I find no guilt in him. He, Pilate could have said, I find no guilt in him. Should I release to you this innocent, not kudeta, not really a king guy? No, he doesn't say that. He says, I, f I find no guilt in him. Should I release to you the king of the Jews? What was he doing? He was trying to show, to kind of ask the people their loyalty. Where are you loyal? This guy who claims to be king of the Jews, your king or is your king really the emperor? Who's really your king? That's what Pilate was doing. He was, he was kind of twisting it a little bit. So he's, he's a hugas kamai, right? Like we all know, Pilate hugas kamai. And they cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. 
Why is this so pivotal? Because this scene reveals the choice of the people when it mattered the most. We can all say what we want, but when it matters the most, who do we choose? That's really the big question. You see, last week we talked about it. Are we loyal to God or are we loyal to self? Because all temptations point to a loyalty to self. That's really it. It's not about me being loyal to this person or that person. It's what they can give me. So it's still really self. This week, the question is, son of God or representation of self? Because they chose Barabbas. Who's Barabbas? A robber. And in other words, a sinner. And they chose a sinner to represent them. What happened here? Our lostness is given center stage along with the love of Christ. In this one scene, we see Christ giving himself up for us and us giving him up for ourselves. We're saying give him up, kill Christ so that I don't have to suffer. So we were actually very selfish. We're saying that Jesus can die so that I don't suffer this earthly consequence. And Jesus' response is, you're half right. I will die for you, yes, so that you won't have to suffer eternal consequences. So here we are trying to save ourselves, but we're doing it the wrong way. He's trying to save us doing it the right way. You see, we choose Barabbas not during pivotal moments of our lives. For the Jews, it was this iconic event, right? You know, Pilate is there. For us, you and me, when I ask the question when it matters most, it doesn't matter most when you're in front of Bongbong Marcos or, or the Vice President Duterte or whoever. When does it matter most to us? It matters most to us when we are tempted in our daily, everyday, boring, uneventful lives. That's when it matters most. We choose Barabbas during every sin. We choose Barabbas during every compromise, every justification of evil or immorality. When it matters most today is when, in the moment, we stay faithful. That's when it matters most. You see, why was the Gospels written? Again, it's missional, right? To seek and save the lost. The Gospels were written so we get to know Christ. As we get to know Christ, we love Christ more. As we love Christ more, we are supposed to go evangelistic mode while going obedience mode. They go together as well. The problem many times for us is this. We do religious stuff and we do ministry, so evangelism mode, but we compromise left and right. Or, we're so focused on being holy and obedient to the Lord but it becomes so self-centered, we don't care about anybody else. You see the problem? It's one of two extremes, and we're supposed to be in the middle. We're supposed to balance it. Yes, I might sin, I might compromise, I repent. But while I repent, I should still go and be on mission. Have you ever seen uh, war movies like uh, Saving Private Ryan, Enemy at the Gates? It's so interesting to me that when I watch these movies, these soldiers go out. They're not perfectly healed, right? They, they don't, they're not like, I go, to, I, I, I go to the clinic for a while and then, you know, my, my scars haven't fully healed. I still have some wounds. I'm still bleeding somewhere. I guess I can't go back into war. No. It's, their attitude is, patch me up just enough so I can go back and be with my brothers and if need be, die for them. Seal my wounds just enough so I can go and love. They're not waiting for a full green HP bar before they get back out there. You know what we do? I'm going to wait until I'm totally, completely, 100%, no, 150% healed. Then I will step out a little bit. Why is that the case? Imagine if that was the attitude of Christ. <laughs> None of us will be here today. We'd all be like desperate. You see, 
we have to really start assessing ourselves when it comes to why the Bible was written. Because many times our problem is when we read the Bible, it's so shallow. It's very kind of fill me up with some comfort and some joy, Lord. There's no mission. There's no purpose. There's nothing higher. It's like enrolling in the military, going to the barracks because you just want the food in their military canteen. Because you, all your friends went there, so you'll go there. Or why am I there? I just want to be fit. I, I need someone to shout at me, so I will be forced to do push-ups. Like, there's a war. I don't want the war. I just want to be fit. I want to have a uniform. I want to go around and people to respect me because I'm a soldier. Do you have any wounds? No. Have you ever been to war? Not really. Are you wanting to be deployed? Hope not. See, we have to be very careful because that's how many Christians treat Christianity today. Minimum requirement. Right? I've done my, I've done my four chapters today and on Sundays, I already have my duties. Here's my duty. I am, I am a... I do this and that. Like, for example, for those giant churches, I am already an usher and I already lift the chairs. That's my job in church. There's a guest sitting. No one's talking to them. Um, I, that's not my job. My job is to lift the chairs and to stack them up together. Look at how neat and straight the, st the chairs are. Done my job. Don't bother me anymore. You see, we have to be very careful. Painful, no, when we think about it. But it's really a challenge for all of us. Look at, um, look at Matthew 28. This is the last chunk of text. So I, I did not choose a lot because I know it's already very, very heavy. Now the 11, so Matthew 28, verse 16. We're in verse 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And guys, of course, Jesus already resurrected here. Uh, this is the last part. So uh, everything is, is done. It's over. He's already risen from the dead, uh, from the grave. Uh, he's, he's about to ascend. So this is his parting words. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I love that that's still here. You see nagani. You see the holes in his hands. Right? And it's still it's still there. Some doubt it. Right? So and Jesus said to the came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold I am I am with you always to the end of the age. Guys, I just wanna point some stuff out. He doesn't say Go therefore and be absolutely holy and stay holy and think of just yourself and read the Bible for yourself and read my word for yourself and become Christ-like for yourself. Doesn't say that. Doesn't also say, go and memorize theology and then memorize my words and, you know, somewhere in the future, a few years from now, they're going to add verses, memorize the verses. You know, like the numbers. Like, no. He says, go and make disciples. That's the whole point of why Christ came to seek and save the lost. He gives us marching orders. Go and make disciples. How? By being holy and teaching. That's why we're supposed to read the Bible. He says here, right? He says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Where do we find all that he commanded us? The Bible. How can we teach the Bible? How can we teach people to obey God if we don't know God? And how do we know God if we don't read God's word? So what's the purpose of reading the Bible? Make disciples. What's the purpose of obeying God, staying holy? Make disciples. What's the purpose of repenting of sin daily and focusing on our sanctification and growth? Make disciples. What's the purpose for why we pray? To make disciples. Why is it that when we obey, God is, uh, God is glorified? It's because the world sees our obedience. If that were not the case, let me just put it this way. God said, if you get a light and you put it under a, or a lamp, right? And then you put it under a basket. Is it useful? No. God never says, you are salt and light. And if you have a light and you put it under a basket, I know that there is a light under that basket. And I'm so pleased that it is so bright under the basket. Does God say that? 
No. God is not, I, this is going to sound controversial, but hear the heart and the context behind it. God is not like super, super, super pleased if you're holy, but the world doesn't see it. Because that's not part of his purpose. His purpose is not for you to be holy in isolation. God's purpose is not for Christians to be secret holy saints. He came to die on the cross for all to see so that the gospel will spread. So, can we erase it once and for all and repent from our minds and our hearts the feeling that as long as I'm obedient and I'm holy, God is pleased. No, your, your, your salt that has lost its saltiness. Why? You're not getting into the food. You're not preserving anything. You're a light under a basket. You're not shedding light to anything. The world around you is still dark. There's, you, you have no effect. That's what we should be thinking of. There's a, you know, the old church I came from had a phrase, and I'm going to steal the phrase today. The phrase is, all roads lead to discipleship. Everything should be to make disciples. Everything we do, everything. Even the obedience, everything. You see, the reason why I chose this as the last text is because it's only appropriate to end with a great commission for this. Why? Well, number one, before he ascended, he ended there. So, <laughs> obviously, that's like a no-brainer. But there's more to it than that. You see, when we began NCC eight years ago, and I remember this, Starbucks, top floor, Ayala, Cebu. When we started, the whole point was to make disciples. And we were very clear about this. The whole goal of NCC is to make disciples, which is why the very first order of business was the discipleship manual. More than the church policy, more than anything, the, the manual was the number one priority because the goal was to make disciples. All churches should have this in mind. It's not for survival, but it's to make disciples. If a church is so focused on survival na lang and no longer thinking of making disciples because they just want to survive, that church, no matter how much everybody is so cool and everybody loves each other and everybody's this and that or whatever pa, it's an unhealthy church. Because a church that has lost its mission of discipleship and is focused on survival, like, okay, go back to na lang, go back to a war. Go back to a war, okay? Soldiers, you're supposed to take one side, right? This soldier needs to, this army needs to get this side the army on the left should get the territory on the right agree if both armies focus on just surviving and not pushing forward and and winning the territory the war will never end because no one's aggressive enough it's just a perpetual war forever why because they're both focused on survival gamay lang a hurt ito balik balik survive survive no we're supposed to be willing to die to take the territory that's why missionaries would go abroad and get speared to death by tribes, right? And then their wives would come in and follow after to minister to the murderers of their husbands. They were willing to die. We're not even willing to have very delicious coffee with somebody who needs to hear the gospel. All churches should have this thought. The macro picture is a macro picture that a soldier's attitude should have. And his attitude should not be to survive the, a war, but to win the war. Even if I die, I want my death to count. How will it count? If we win. You know, most soldiers, when, it, when they die in battle, like I, I, so I googled, right? And I googled, you know, like soldiers who did not survive and their parting words. Men, it's so interesting. I assumed, I assumed their parting words would be, Go look for my family and tell them how much I love them. That's that's probably my mind, right? Or like go go and, and survive and have children of your own, like, you know, flee this war. But not really. You know what I found out? And uh, psychologically, here's the thing. When they go through so much pain, hurt, suffering I in the war, they go through a lot together and they have a purpose. You know their final words? It's usually along the lines of win this. Like, I'm going to die, win this. You go, you like... If we, we, we all die, we all die, we all see each other in the long in the afterlife, but win this. Why? Because they've prepared everything already for their families. They have the letters. They, they, all of that, they've counted the cost now. If I die, my family knows. 
I've got letters sent to them. I've got my last will. It's all ready. So my final words to my fellow soldier, go. Take the hill. For us, what are our, fi what are our words, guys? Go. Order coffee. I mean, come on. The, the standards are so different. No? Go hang out. Sounds so heroic. Go. Minister to them. Die if you must. Really? This is the challenge. I'm comparing them because this is what we're supposed to have. The problem is many get comfortable in the barracks. We enter the barracks and we enjoy it so much. And we don't take the war seriously anymore. And so we stagnate. You know the problem of stagnation? Have you ever seen stagnant water? I'm sure you have. Somewhere in the house, there's probably something there. And what happens to stagnant water? Bacteria starts to creep in, right? It turns green. And then you see those wriggly things. Yes, and then it smells bad. And then you start to worry and you start to, to get sick because that water is there. It contaminates the food. You really have to throw it out. You see, stagnation in the spiritual life is very similar. Stagnation in the spiritual life of a church is also similar. We have five loves, which is connected to our five disciplines. How are we in each one? I'm not going to answer that. We're going to go through that eventually. But think about it for yourself for now. As an individual lang muna. How is your love for God? How is your love for holiness? How is your love for scripture? How is your love for the church? How is your love for the lost? Let's ask it in terms of practical things. Are you exercising faith? When you're tempted, love for God. Right? How about holiness? Are we, are we still prayerful about things in life? Really, really praying. How about reading the Bible? Like really, not just reading and then, uh, kapuya, hapit ako mahuman for chapters. Yes, ang last one kay Proverbs, short lang ni. Like, <laughs> but really, or is it for chapters na to? Kuwang mani? Right? How, how is your real love? Like, are you enjoying God's work? How about love for church? And I'm not talking about gimingo naman ko sa church people. Uy, katawanan, kipermi kumalingaw magkuyog nila. No, it's not that. That's easy. It's when, hala na sakit si so-and-so. What can I do? Have you interceded and prayed? Have you called? Have you asked? How are they? Have you visited? Have you, you know, practical love, real love for the church? Not, how are you? How are you? It's, it's your phone opening it up for people to call you. Things like that. Or too busy. And last, love for the lost. And we make excuses. It wasn't the right time. I am waiting for God's opportune time. You know, God's opportune time, sometimes it's now. Many times, people are just waiting. You know, how is it? How's our evangelistic efforts? How do you fix stagnant water? If you cannot throw out stagnant water, how do you fix it? By the keyword stagnant. So what's the opposite? Uh, not stagnant. <laughs> so flowing or or so so how do you make water not stagnant? You you steer, you disturb it. Agree? You gotta disturb it somehow. You gotta do something to to wreck the stagnation. It has to be shaken. Sometimes a barracks needs to get bombed so that soldiers are forced to go out and fight. You see the analogy there? And many times, when it comes to spiritual stagnation, Christians have to be shaken to the core and their hearts have to be challenged. God needs to put them in really, really disturbing situations that totally removes their routine, totally removes their comfort zone, totally kicks them out. So they're forced to become real soldiers. There's one uh, illustration that I really like. Eagles. You know how eagles learn to fly? It's so interesting. So eagles have a nest and their nest is usually high up. They're very high up. Like 
like a uh, uh, scary high, okay? So that falling from that height will take a long time. And so the mother eagle <laughs> just kicks them off the nest. And then the baby eagle has to fly or die. That's really it. But of course, the, the mama eagle is, is flying downwards also just watching, right? So they kick the baby eagle. It's like, ah, try to fly. Mommy, mommy, help. And if can't fly, the mother eagle just picks, like, catches them, brings them up, back up to the nest, and then tomorrow, <laughs> again, until they finally get to fly. You know, the interesting thing about Christians is many times there's a temptation to have that spiritual routine and comfort. I'm already okay, like, you know, I'm doing my thing, I'm, you know. God has to kick us out sometimes. And so, that's what we have to do. We have to kick ourselves out of our comfort zones intentionally. Or, God will do it for us. It's one of those two. So, to conclude, many possible ways to conclude. So, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to ask or I'm just going to look at four things and it's up to you. Which one applies to you the most? First, are we just going for intellectual vanity? Activity without purpose. Busy for nothing. Getting to know God and all of that. Okay. What's your purpose? Get to know God lang. Patay. You're the lamp under the basket. Can you imagine God saying, I'm so proud of you. The under the basket is so bright and there's darkness everywhere. Second, how's your compassion for others? How's your love for others? I'm talking about both Christian and non-Christian. Are you there for them? Are you willing to are you willing to order coffee for them? Drink that coffee, eat some cake with them. Are you willing to lose maybe an hour or two of sleep for them? Both Christians and non-Christians. Number three, how is your spiritual life in terms of holiness? Sins, compromises, uh, justification of evil here and there. How's your personal life with God? Lastly, how comfortable are you? How's... How's the water? Is it stagnant in your life? Spiritual waters? Or do you need God to disturb the waters and to really, really kick you out of the nest, so to speak? So I know this is painful to hear, but if I may just end with this lang. What was the purpose of the Gospels? Why were they written? It is for us to get to know Christ. It's missional. What was the mission of Christ? He came to seek and save the lost and to fulfill the law and the prophets. What was the purpose or what was the prophecy that Christ was to fulfill? To seek and save the lost. What is his marching orders for us now? Go and make disciples. Not go and shine bright your light and then hide under baskets. Right? It's really go. And so we have to get back to that, really, really get back to that, especially in our new season in, as, a, as Christians and as a church as a whole, right? So I'll, I'll end with that. I'll end with prayer. And then after prayer, some, I'll give some announcements, okay? So yeah, let's pray.